Listener supported. WNYC Studios. Hi there, Ira here. You know, the end of the year is right around the corner, and we want to hear your favorite science stories of 2018. What affected you the most? Or was there an interesting discovery that you're still talking about? We want to hear from you. Record a voice memo with your name, city, and what your top story is, and email it to voices at sciencefriday.com. That's a voice memo, your name, city, and what the top story is. Email it to voices at sciencefriday.com. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Flato. Coming up, our picks for best science books of the year. Looking for that special gift for someone who likes to read books? Well, we want to hear what you have to suggest. Also, you can tell us by calling us. You can make the call, but only if you make the call. 844-724-8255. That's 844-SCI-TALK or tweet us at SciFry. But first, when you go to the museum to see a popular exhibit, sometimes you have to fight through the crowds, right, to get up front to see all the details. But there's another group also scurrying around trying to get a closer look at these pieces of art. The microbes, fungi, bacteria, even lichens like to grow on paintings and monuments, and they can do damage to these artworks. So so how do you protect a painting from these microbes? Well, you call in a biologist, and that's my next guest. Robert Kessler is a cell biologist, director of the Smithsonian's Museum Conservation Institute in Suitland, Maryland. Welcome to Science Friday. Thank you, Ira. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, it's nice to have you. Uh, there are microbes crawling around everywhere. Why is a painting a good habitat for these microbes? Well, a painting, any painting or any surface is a great habitat. The, the microbes are around us all the time in spore form. And when they land on a surface, if there's moisture there, they'll start growing. So uh, it sometimes happens that our paintings uh, are, are too close to an outside wall, uh-huh. and they get condensate forming on the back of it, and the microbes land that have already landed there will start growing in the water and within three or four days you'll get a nice little growth of of particularly fungi growing on these things is, is, if you don't yeah no i'm just saying is, is there a list of usual suspects that grow on the on the, the on the paintings and, and the walls oh, well almost any fungus mm. will grow on them that they're they're so good at eating anything that you just put them on a surface, if, they can, if there's enough moisture there, they'll start trying to figure out a way to eat it. Mm-hmm. And what, what shows up on the paintings in particular? Like whether... Well, what, what shows up there, we had a case once of a Chumley painting that was called Autumn. It was an egg tempera on masonite. And what happened, this was a rolling hill scene with a nice little stream in front. And from a distance, it looked like there was snow, a light coating of snow on the hills. And when you got closer, it looked like a fog had rolled in on the hills. And when you got really close, you could see the fungal hyphae standing up with the fruiting bodies, like little trees. It was absolutely beautiful from a biological point of view. <laughs> so you loved it as a biologist, but as a conservation person, <laughs> well, you didn't I, want I was, to see that. <laughs> I was thrilled. And when the, the curators see me being thrilled about something, they know there's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so well, when, when you say a problem, what kind of damage can these microbes do to a piece of artwork? Well, if you leave them long enough, they'll start eroding some of the, the pigments or some of the, the ground or the gesso or uh, even getting onto the cotton substrate. And it'll start weakening the surface. And if you let it go long enough, years sometimes, depending on how wet it is, you'll get the paint flaking off the surface. Wow. Oh. Is there, a, is there a, a special paint they like more than others? I mean, Well, they don't like paints that have heavy metals in them, things like lead, copper, zinc, uh, mercury, that, that tends to slow them down or stop them completely. The acrylic paints they'll like, uh, egg tempera they like, because it, it has so much protein in it. So they're looking for certain nutrients that to keep them going, nitrogen particularly. Mm-hmm. If, if it's an older, the older the painting, is it more edible, delicious to the, you know, the microbes because they, they don't yeah, have the modern stuff in them? Well, the, the, the older ones tend to have a lead ground in them, so oh. they tend to be a little more, more poisonous. But also, the, the ones of the, the old masters that we see have been around a long time, and they've survived all kinds of things, usually climate, uh, poor climate control in churches or museums. So they, they're survivors of, the, of a horrible environment and attacked by microbes. Mm-hmm. Are there certain areas on the painting that are more susceptible? Uh, 
it, it all depends. Perhaps the edges would be more likely to be attacked first because they moisture might get onto those first, uh, and then it would spread from there coming in. Mm -hmm. but, if it, but it all depends on where the moisture is coming from. If it's coming through the whole back, well, then the whole front surface is like a li liable to be attacked. Let me ask you more about that John Chumley painting that looked so beautiful. What did what what was it, what was the outcome? What did you wind up doing with that painting? Well, what we wound up doing was that we could not put anything on the surface to kill it. There there are some tricks in our tool chest, biocides that we sometimes use, but anything we were going to put on the surface to kill the fungus would also have interacted with the paint and damaged it. So what we ended up doing was a technique that I developed at the, in the museum world, which was called a suffocation process using argon gas. So we basically wrapped the object up in a bag, replaced the oxygen-rich air with argon, almost pure argon, and let it sit like that. And it eventually it dried out a bit. We put it in around 50% relative humidity so we could bring the humidity down. But the argon, the lack of oxygen stopped any growth immediately. And then we could dry the piece out over time. Hmm. And that would take the moisture out and stop any future problem. So all the fungal tissue stopped growing and some of the fungi dies under argon. And then the conservator could go in and just remove it with a Q-tip very easily, or well, laboriously, but easily. Wow, cheap tool. Um, isn't that sort of the same thing you see at the, in, 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 when you go into Washington, you look at the preservation for the, you know, the, the great documents of the United States, they're all under Argon, you know, Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, right. things like that? Right, and that, that's because it's so totally inert that we won't get any oxidation going on there. That was the main reason for doing not so much insect or, or fungal control, but more for uh, that the, the, uh, the uh, iron gall ink wouldn't react Hmm. From you know, it wouldn't oxidize in air, okay. so it's very nicely preserved. And so that's the green glow you see. And well, you have to put a little charge to it. I think they have <laughs> might have, they might have a green. <laughs> if you put a current through argon, it'll turn out a little bit blue. It turns like neon. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's glowing. Um, well, was ar was argon always used as a preservative, or were other gases used? Well, sometimes nitrogen is used. Yeah, uh, it's cheaper, and that's been fairly common. Uh, the, the reason we use argon is it will kill fungal tissue, whereas nitrogen just keeps them alive. Mm -hmm. So whenever we think we've got fungi there, we want to use argon. What about helium or something like that? We, I've tried helium, but it's very difficult to keep that into a bag. And it doesn't, it's, it has such a small molecule, it won't push the oxygen out of the way. So we've got to get that oxygen out, and the argon does a very nice job of doing that. When you have it in a bag, the argon sinks to the bottom, and the oxygen will rise to the top when you just let it sit. Oh, that's, that's a trick of the trade. Yeah, and nitrogen does the opposite. Nitrogen will rise to the top, and oxygen will sink to the bottom. Do, don't want to do that, no. <laughs> right. And usually your object's on the bottom. <laughs> details, details. I know you work, you work to stop an infestation of book lice in a monastery. Tell us about that. Oh, that was, a, that was quite a fascinating one. That uh, This was the Great Lava Monastery in the Helkidi Peniki Peninsula in Greece, closest to the Bosphorus. And it was uh, somebody sent me some insects to identify uh, when I was at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I not only did fungi, but I did insect control. Mm -hmm. So I looked at these and said, well, these are book lice, okay. But book lice, what are they doing on a book that's in a library? They're supposed to be eating fungi. So why do they have them on their books? So they brought me over to take a look at this. Uh, and it was it was a fascinating experience because it took about 24 hours to get there in different forms of transportation, the last being a boat to the, the they call it an island, but it's a peninsula, and then a jeep driven by a monk over these rough roads. Till the middle of the night, I arrived at this monastery, and I was expecting the western kind of monastery, something from Umberto Eco, the name of the rose. Mm -hmm. I had this vision in my head about western medieval kind of structures. And this was so different. It was Byzantine. The courtyard was a rough stone with grass between it, and all, most of the structures had a rounded dome on it. It was very, very pretty, very different than what I expected. Uh, and there were about a dozen or two dozen monks in this very giant structure. The, the Great Lava Monastery is, was built and started in the 10th century. Mm -hmm. It's the oldest monastery on the peninsula, right under the Mount Athos mountain. Uh, and when I got there, the, the, I found these about 2,000 rare books they had in a 19th century building. And the building 
was uh, sort of a U-shaped structure. One side had a rare book, the other side had their uh, uh, pieces of very um, books, the Thessaloniki that they had when they first started at the monastery. But anyway, as I looked at this, there were some, the books had all been put into cloth covers, and the Greek conservators had written on the outside in Greek, Greek to me and Greek to them, what the condition of the manuscripts were, what they, whether they needed conservation and so on. And then they put them on shelves against the wall. And I realized the walls were outside walls of the building. And as I looked at the outside of the building, there were no gutters and leaders on the building. So the water was running from rain, would run down the side of the building, wick up the wall, seep into the inside, and get onto these cotton cloth covers, soak into the, into the books, and then stain the edges of the books with water, and fungus would start growing on the books. Wow. So we'd open them up and take a look, and you'd have maybe two or three inch section all around the books covered with fungi, and that's what the book lice were eating. So the whole problem was water. When you look at what caused this, why were these book lice here, you go back to, well, we, we just put gutters and leaders on this building and get the water away from the building. We'll solve our complete problem. And did they? And it did, yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, I ended up treating a few of these with argon again, the uh, favorite thing, just to show them how to do it and to just to, to stop the fungal growth immediately. So, so you're, uh, like, you're, you're like a detective then. You have to figure well, out. Well, we do. It is. It, we, wanna, we always want to know the cause. When we see a problem, we've got to look at, well, it's not enough just to treat the symptom like a physician. We, we look at the same thing. They want to know why. They see the symptoms. They want to know what the real cause is. And once we know the cause, we can say, well, how we, you know, we have to change that cause because if we solve the immediate problem, we put it back in the same environment, we're gonna get, we'll get the same problem again. Wow. Sounds like we have an interesting job there. It, it's been very fascinating. Yeah, it led me to go around the world a few times. Yeah. And uh, we need more people like you because things are getting old all the time, aren't they? <laughs> As we are. <laughs> Absolutely. I can vouch for that. Thank you, Dr. Kessler. <laughs> You're welcome. Dr. Kessler is director of the Smithsonian's Museum Conservation Institute in uh, Suitland, Maryland, right over the border from, from D.C. We're going to take a break, and uh, it's time for our annual roundup of the best science books of the year. We want to hear from you. Give us a call, 844-724-8255, 844 Sci Talk, or of course, as always, you can tweet us at Sci Fry. We're going to talk about uh, the best books of 2018, and you'll get some good ideas for holiday books if you're still looking. And uh, we got our book experts with us. We're going to have Stephanie uh, Sandula, Deborah Blom, and uh, Dr. Eric Topol will be here. And uh, we'll have you too. So stay with us. We'll be right back after the break. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Plato. You know, my job involves reading a lot of science books every year. I mean, we get, I'm, I'm not making this up, we get about 50 to 100 books a week that come into our office, and we have piles of them back at the office, hundreds of titles about biology, art, technology, space, sometimes even science fiction. That's why it's always fun to pick through the piles uh, for our annual roundup of books uh, that we couldn't forget for, for best science book of 2018. And all week long, we've been asking you, our faithful listeners, to send us voice memos with your picks. And here's one. My name is Jeff Grant from Batavia, Illinois, and my book recommendation for 2018 is The Rise and Fall of Dinosaurs by Steve Brissati. Dr. Brissati writes in an eloquent way that is easy for everybody to understand, and he sheds new light on dinosaur evolution. It is a must-read for all of you dino buffs out there. Mm -hmm. Me being one of them, it's one of my favorite books of the year. Well, we had this one also from Julie G. in New Jersey. Origin Story by David Christian. Uh, it gives you the big history of everything, just like it says. It's really informative, and I'm still picking up the pieces of my mind that it blew while reading it. Definitely deserves a second read. Now, we've gathered a panel of readers here with us, too, to guide us through Year the year in books we want to know what they thought about them. Stephanie Sandala Sandala like New York dollar. Yeah. <laughs> Sandala is an associate editor at Library Journal Reviews here in New York. She's with us here in our New York studios. Welcome. Sci Thank Fry. you. Thank you for having me, Ira. You're welcome. Deborah Blum, director of the Night Science Journalism Program at MIT and author of The Poison Squad, a solid pick as. 
we'll be talking about it. Welcome back, Deborah. Thank you. It's great to be back. Dr. Eric Topol, a cardiologist and executive vice president and professor at Scripps Research in La Jolla, California. Good to have you back, Eric. Thanks, Ira. Good to be with you. And we have a full list of our panel's recommendations and some of mine. You can see them all at sciencefriday.com slash best books. So let's get right to it. Stephanie, give us your top pick. Uh, my top pick is Spying on Whales by Nick Pienson. This was a great history um, of the evolution of whales from the time when they were um, still had were living on land and had four legs and were the size of small domestic dogs until their time now when they're the largest aquatic animals. I really like how he talked about how we don't actually know much about whales. They're very enigmatic. They live far at sea. They travel deep to places we don't um, know and to light doesn't reach. So they're difficult to photograph and tag. So I think the mysterious element makes it even more intriguing. That's what I really liked about it, just the curiosity aspect. Yeah, that's always a good thing. Right. And I think for us, it was the best book for teens, too, because teens are, would be interested. Just, you know, his writing is so accessible. Um, it's really fun. It's just like a great introduction to science or to fossils. And it was just a really fun read overall. Hmm. Eric, what's your top book? My favorite was uh, Carl Zimmer's uh, She Has Her Mother's Laugh. Um, Carl is uh, well known to anyone follows science, uh, the New York Times with matter, but this, is, I think, is his 12th book, and it's a masterpiece. It covers everything about genetics, uh, from the fact we're all mosaics to the microbiome to having his own genome sequence, and it is done in the most uh, extraordinary storytelling way. So it's just so readable and uh, Fascinating, really a great book. Interesting. Deborah, do you have a pick? Deborah, go ahead. Okay. Hi. Hi there. So uh, I've been looking at the pile of books. I brought them all with me here, and, and some, so many of them are more serious than the one I am going to pick first. But I'm going to start with The Mystery of the Exploding Teeth. Uh, and Other Curiosities from the History of Medicine by Thomas Morris. I, I just every time I dive into this book, I find something I love in it as a portrait of the way we used to think about medicine, uh, both hilarious or just completely horrifying or kind of startling. And this is a book that walks through a whole bunch of case histories from uh, medicine going back into the 1700s and uses facsimiles of the actual papers and quotes the doctors. And today when I was uh, coming over here, I was reading about the warnings for authors in which there was actually a uh, medical theory that uh, too much reading melted your brain, and they found a case of a writer who, after he read too much, decided that his body was made of butter, and so <laughs> he would not get too close to the fireplace in case he would melt. And I just, you know, <laughs> I'm reading this, and literally I had this moment of sort of heartfelt love for someone who would go so deep into these old scientific journals and papers and let us see how people used to think. Wow, that's, that's, that's a great idea. Yeah. We should melt from reading too much. Yeah. <laughs> like butter. <laughs> like, well, let's, let's go to our listeners. Let's see what, what our first listener has to say about Let's go to Jackie in Houston. Hi, Jackie. Hi there. Uh, great to talk with you, Ira. I'm a real fan of the show. Thank you. Go yes, ahead. my uh, book pick is um, Factfulness by Hans Rosling. And it, it lists that uh, the 10 reasons we're wrong about the world and why things are better than you think. So in the midst of our political climate and kind of uh, science denial in many areas, this is using uh, statistics and logic to really open our eyes about how, you know, modern science has really been very beneficial for us as a people, rather than um, us kind of thinking about, you know, the doomsday scenario of climate change that we're, we're all approaching, even though he does deal with that as well in the book. So it's just, it's a real, I mean, it makes me uncomfortable to read parts of it, which to me is always kind of a, a sign of a good book. 
Hmm, that's a that's a great pick. Thank you, Jackie, for for pointing that one out. Did you hear? Did you hear about that one? At all, I Stephanie? haven't. I need to look into that one. Yeah. So I'm getting some pointers from everyone. Yeah. And Hans Rosling. I mean, he unfortunately died very young. I think it was in the last year. He was such a pioneer in kind of making people think about the evidence that lies behind science. He was really brilliant, mm-hmm. and he's a real loss. I. I, I was really excited to hear her mention his name. That's great. I'll just throw in one of my picks for this sure. year, and that was Michael Pollan's How to Change Your Mind. Mm-hmm. That, they, it, you know, not to be dry, it was mind blowing that book. You know, yeah. it was just amazing. Yeah, he's a great writer. One of my favorites, too. Yeah. So, yeah. so Ira, you yes. think taking uh, acid is, is okay? <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to figure this one out. Well, I think he, he lays out a good te- good case for studying it. Okay. You know, okay. and not in a, you know, not in a, in a very controlled atmosphere and, mm-hmm. and not just acid. He goes into rooms, mushrooms and things like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, and how now it is being uh, looked at seriously once again because, you know, the people who did it in the 60s sort of ruined the science of it. And they're rediscovering it. So did he make you see validity for the science, Ira, or did he make you want to try it yourself? Um... How do I answer that? <laughs> <laughs> I have to say the way he the way he laid it out, it it sort of does make me want to try it myself. I mean, wow, wow. In, a, in a controlled way, uh, because I'm just a pure geek, and if I can geekify <laughs> something, and I know Eric, that you're a geek too, so I yeah, fo- followed, followed you. <laughs> no question. <laughs> but I'm not trying any of that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Say, I won't, I won't get in an elevator, but I'll try that stuff. <laughs> so, I know, but it's interesting how, uh, you know, how it's, uh, I, I always, I just think that the fact that we are now trying it in the way we should have done it or experimented with it in the way we should have done it years ago. He sort of uh, opened up that, that, that door again. Okay. okay, Stephanie, your second book. Give us your second. Um, my second book was Rising by Elizabeth Brush. So this one was about climate change, and I like how she puts a really human aspect of it. Um, she goes to Oregon, California, Florida, Louisiana, and Maine, and she lets people talk in their own words. So some chapters are just people telling their fears, their worries, their concerns. I really liked how she interviewed people um, who are Native American living in Louisiana whose homes are on stilts because the bayou and the ocean are now one and the same. Mm. And instead of having shrimp and fish, they see dolphins in the area around their home. So she just really gives a great personal overview of climate change and how it's affecting people. Yeah, and that's a, it's a, maybe the right book at the right time. Exactly, yes. You know, because I think we're actually seeing some movement at climate change. Yes, yeah. Finally, after all these years. Let's go, let's go to the phones. We'll go around, we'll go around in, the, in a round robin circle. Let's go to John in Santa Fe. Hi, John. Hi, Ira. Hi there, go ahead. Yes, uh, my favorite was uh, uh, Chasing New Horizons, um, the book about the uh, inside the epic first mission to Pluto by Alan Stern and David Grinspoon. Right, right. Great book. We had them on talking about it. Yes, yes. And uh, I teach uh, astronomy at uh, Santa Fe Community College and um, had uh, encouraged my students to also uh, delve into the book as well. Yeah. Just exciting, the entire process and the, uh, and, um, the, the whole uh, pursuit of discovery. Yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks for that, that recommendation. Uh, Eric, what do you think about that? Uh, well, the book after the, the next book I was really keen on was Bad Blood. Mm-hmm. Um, this book is uh, the story of Theranos, the massive fraud that occurred uh, by the journalist who broke it at the Wall Street Journal, John Carreyrou. What's amazing about it is it took him almost a year to be able to get these disgruntled, brave employees to come forth and tell their story because of the threat of what would happen in their careers. Uh, And then it really delved into things that we hadn't actually even known about, which was how patients were getting erroneous lab tests, uh, and then they were being suppressed by the company uh, from telling their story to this journalist. So it's an amazing, shocking story uh, of of a company that was just uh, engaged in just more fraud than anyone could ever imagine. I think that was the theme of the book. Uh, there's going to be a movie about it, uh, and I think, uh, as I understand it, Jennifer Lawrence is playing Elizabeth Holmes, so that ought to be pretty interesting. Hmm. Deborah, are you familiar with that book? Yeah, it's a fantastic investigation, and Carrie won the 
Pulitzer Prize for the Wall Street Journal with the original investigation and then parlayed it into a book. And and I heard him talk at the Online News Association and, and the efforts by the people at Theranos to silence everyone, including him, is an incredible part of the story. It's a story of journalistic courage, among other things. Mm -hmm. So true. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, that was one of our top, um, our long list, top pit, 10 picks, too, for science and technology. It's just a great reporting and a great, interesting story. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's a lot of a lot of good reporting going on these days. Mm -hmm. A lot of digging up of stuff that we hadn't heard about. Let's let's see we go let's see what kinds of digging up we can do on the phone. Let's go to Rick in uh, Centennial, Colorado, one of my favorite places. I love the well, name. Thank you, Ira, and and thank you for having me on and giving me a chance to advocate for a book that I just absolutely loved reading earlier this year, which is a book called Endure, and then the rest of the title I just think is perfect: Mind, Body, and the Curiously Elastic Limits of Human Performance. Uh, a mm -hmm. Canadian author, Alex Hutchinson, and you get some help from Malcolm Gladwell, who writes the foreword really uh, using Nike's uh, work with Kipchoge to try to run a sub two hour marathon, he really dives into what we know and what we don't know about why some humans are able to perform at such a high level and, and why some aren't. And uh, I'm, I, 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 uh, I love this book in particular because at 48 years old and competing in triathlon, um, I look for absolutely anything that is both scientific and interesting to uh, engage my mind. Uh, but this moves from being sort of bench research to being clinical uh, because I was able to take and apply a lot of what I read in this book uh, into how I approach my own training. And I think uh, anyone uh, during this holiday season who is shopping for um, an athlete uh, you already know they're quirky and geeky and all of the rest of it, impossible to shop for. So I think I've made your shopping easy. Uh, just give them a copy of this and watch them scurry off into the corner and get all excited. So uh, I don't know if any of your guests or yourself have, have read the book yet, but it's, it's, a, um, right. it's a fascinating area of science where the biomechanical and the psychological come together. All right, Rick, we got it. We, it's, we, it's, uh, you sold it. You, you sold the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, this is science. Friday from WNYC Studios. We're talking about uh, best books of the year with uh, Stephanie Sandala, Deborah Blum, and uh, Dr. Eric Topol. Um, uh, Deborah, give us your next pick on the list. I'm going to kind of lump two of mine together because they both deal with climate change here. Uh, one of them is Chesapeake Requiem, which is about uh, the vanishing or the vanishing nature of Tangier Island out at the edge of the Chesapeake. And the other is In Search of the Canary Tree by Lauren Oaks, which is about one tree in Alaska, uh, the yellow cedar, which is uh, sort of both of these are climate change stories. The Tangier Island, which has been the home to fishermen in Chesapeake Bay forever, is disappearing, literally disappearing due to rising waters. And the warmth that is occurring in Alaska is, is starting to erase the yellow cedar. And they're very different books. I, I picked them both because I think climate change is the biggest story uh, of our lives, mm -hmm. the biggest, the scariest, the most important. Uh, the most immediate, and so Chesapeake Bay is a story of these this community of fishermen on this tiny island who are dealing from with the disappearance of everything they've known, and who mostly don't want to deal, right? Which right. I think we often do. So it's a wonderful microcosm <clears throat> of sort of the humor inter human interaction with the changing world. Uh, not a cheerful one, yeah. necessarily, whereas In Search of the Canary Tree, I loved because in the end, it's buoyant, right? It's not about the resilience of even imperiled species and the importance of taking care of them. And, and the it's almost like a little slideshow of interactions. She puts up a post-it note. What does this tree have to teach me? And she follows that for eight years. And as she takes you through the lessons of the tree, it gives you a lot more faith in, in people and their willingness to care 
and to learn than I, I think some of us feel when we look at that climate change problem. Yeah. And while well, I'm still going on, she's a gorgeous writer. I mean, a poetic writer. And I just wanted to read this one line. Please. If, if fear is the absence of breath and faith is a positive fourth, I want to breathe into an uncertain future. And she uses that to kind of set up where how she wants us to think about the changing planet and the importance of being in the now and trying to take care of it. It's a lovely book. Wow. Can't get a better rec- recommendation than that. We're going to take yeah. a break and uh, come back. Chat more about your favorite books. Our number, 844-724-8255. As they say in the trade, we have open lines. You can get in, 844-724-8255. You can also tweet us at SciFry, talking with Stephanie Sandala, associate editor at the Library Journal Reviews. Deborah Blum, a Pulitzer Prize-winning writer and director of the Knight Science Journalism Program at MIT and author of The Poison Squad. She's not recommending her own book. This <laughs> Stephanie is. I think yeah. gonna... <laughs> Eric Topol, cardiologist and executive vice president, professor at Scripps Research in La Jolla, California, a uh, geek just like I am, but he does it really well. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back after this break, so you don't go away. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Flato. We're talking about the best science books of the year with our panelist, Stephanie Sandala of Library Journal Reviews, Deborah Blum of the Knight Science Journalism Program at MIT, and Dr. Eric Topol of Scripps Research. And we're getting suggestions from you out there, our listeners also. Let me play a couple of them. Here's one that landed in our inbox earlier this week. This is Steve in Seattle, and I recommend The Promise of the Grand Canyon, John Wesley Powell's perilous journey and his vision for the American West. In addition to being just an exciting read about Powell's journey through the Grand Canyon, it also addresses his being way ahead of his time in dealing with issues that we're still addressing today, land use issues, environmental issues, the government and private industry. I think it's a great read. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. I mean, that was that was very interesting. Yeah, I really like that one. Yeah. I like environmental history. Yeah. So that was yeah, one of environment, my, Yeah, that was one of your. Yeah, that was. Pick, my, I really like that one also. So. What 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 made you like it so much? Um, I think I'm just really interested in environmental history, yeah. and especially now land use is such a you know a popular topic that we're still thinking about, and even more so now. So it's still really relevant. So. It's very accessible, too. All right. Maybe you'll like this pick from Laura in yes. Boulder. I wanted to recommend Ben Goldfarb's book, Eager, The Surprising Secret Life of Beavers and Why They Matter. It'll just completely make you rethink what a natural stream should look like. What a great idea. <laughs> it's a great endorsement. I, 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 I love that. Uh, you know, did you know did, that book? I did not, but I think beavers are really fascinating. So now I, I'm going to put that on my list. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm adding some to my list, too. <laughs> our, re- our readers strike, our listeners strike again. So it's, <laughs> it's always good to get some uh, some suggestions. And if you have a suggestion, our number 844-724-8255. Also, you can tweet us uh, at Cy Fry. Um, you know, we I'm waiting for a list, some listener to come up with some sort of science of cooking book. Every once in a year, every once in a while in the year, we have a science. We haven't done that one yet. Maybe someone, unless Deborah, you know of one that you want to suggest, or Eric no, or Stephanie. No, all the recipes I know will kill you, Eric. So. <laughs> 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 well, yeah, yeah, you have trouble having people coming over to eat at your house, Deborah. Constantly, actually. <laughs> 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 oh, yes. Would you taste that first before you give it to me? <laughs> um, Deborah, how is, your, how is your book doing this year? It's been actually, it's been really exciting to see it end up on a lot of great lists this month. Um, mm-hmm. uh, New York Times Notable Books and Smithsonian named it one of the 10 best science books of the year, and Bustle named it one of the 25 best nonfiction books of the year, period, which was really exciting. I, I told my friends it's the only time in my life I'm ever going to be on the same list as Michelle Obama. Um, you know, the, the day that I sell two million copies of a book in two weeks, I will retire. <laughs> I'll bet, Congratulations. I'll bet great. you don't. <laughs> well, I, I uh, know you. Stephanie, yeah, did, you read, did you read that book? I haven't read it yet, but it's on my list. I swear, Deborah. <laughs> <laughs> you have to say that, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, let's go to you. What's your next pick? Well, I have two uh, that I'd put in the the physician author category that are quite extraordinary. Uh, First, uh, Sandeep Jahar uh, is a cardiologist and he wrote a book called Heart, A History. And it's quite remarkable because it it tracks the big milestones in the field of uh, cardiology 
And even though I was familiar with many of them, he tells them in a way that's just uh, quite extraordinary. And he also gets into his own personal familial mm. uh, is issues with heart disease. The other one by Mona Hanna Atisha is just an amazing book. She's a pediatrician in Flint, and she was the one that broke the whole lead in the water poisoning uh -huh. there. And uh, she's a hero. I mean, she just was persistent, and she challenged the local uh, government and authorities, and she just basically exposed it all. Uh, just uh, what she had has done uh, for Flint, Michigan is just amazing. Yeah, I love that book. I was so glad to see that was on your list. And, and she is a hero. And, and one of the things I think people who don't know that story don't realize is how in the first defensive reaction by Michigan and state and city officials and even the EPA, people did their very best to destroy her reputation and make her testimony not count. And she stood up. She's incredibly brave mm -hmm. and dedicated. Absolutely, Deborah. And no question about it. It's always interesting in your first pick about uh, Sanjeep's book on the heart. Is he a cardiologist? Yes, in New York City. And, yes. You know, we've seen these stories where cardiologists or other doctors, they come down with the very illness that they are specialists in. Yes. And I, we've gone through a few cardiologist books over the years, and they are the interesting part about these books is they'll, they'll tell you, I'm just as scared as you are, and I'm the doctor. Right. <laughs> exactly. Is that, yeah. Did that happen in this book? Well, th this was his, his in his family, not him. Yeah. But, uh, it certainly could uh, hit him in the years ahead. He's pretty young. Yeah, let's see if we have uh, let's see if we have any tweets that have come in about things that the, the people wanted. To. Here's one. Um, Caw on Twitter says, Tangled Tree is a must-read mm -hmm. and a deep, enjoyable one at that. It's not only a great recounting of how science works, it also doesn't have a tidy ending also like science. That's David Quammen's book. It, you know, he's a gorgeous writer. I, I mean, if you go back and look at sort of the landscape of his work, he's such an amazing stylist. So mm -hmm. I'm glad to see that come up. Stephanie, yeah, you're nodding uh, yeah, a lot. Yeah, I am too. I'm glad to yeah. see that on a list. He is a great writer, um, and he just makes science so fun and so, you know, available to people. Mm -hmm. Do you find any trends that you look at a lot of books, Stephanie? Yes. Are there any trends that you can pick out during any year? This is this. They're going in this direction or that direction. Um, um, we are seeing a lot more environmental books. Um, just I think climate change, just in general, has sparked publishers to think more about publishing books that about how we're how weather is impacting us and we're impacting weather. So just trends like that, I'm seeing a lot more of. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we can go to the phones. Lots of people with some interesting comments. Let's go to uh, Cordelia in Wilmington, North Carolina. Hi there. Hey, thank you for taking my call. I just want to recommend, as my favorite sci-fi novel of the year, Job Herself um, by Joseph Kadat. It is an epic uh, space opera. Uh, it's set off-planet, uh, far in the future, and it just is, is very compelling characters and a very almost Shakespearean plot of uh, loss, revenge, and ultimately of redemption. Wow! And I just thought it was highly, it was highly original. And as a bonus, it was a few things I thought which was really interesting was that it is a book that uh, features a prominently um, African American family, and mm. it's just something you don't typically see. I mean, it's just as it happened, the author literally did it as a roll of the dice to determine where they were from in ethnicity. But it just happens that, you know, it's like, well, geez, I realized when I read it, like, I've never seen that before. So I just thought it was a very original voice. Yeah, we, li we like sci science fiction here. Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a, it's a window. Thank, that, thank you for the recommendation. Uh, anybody? Uh, can you have a, do you have a comment? Oh, no, uh, I, I just like science fiction, too. So yeah. I was nodding along. <laughs> All right, well, you, let me go back to our questions because we, we have a question that was emailed to us from Leslie in Parma, Ohio, who says, how about science books for science honor students in high school? My grandson is taking science, and I don't know what to buy him. 
let's hope he's not listening right now. Okay, maybe he's getting a book. You know. Right. <laughs> Do you have a suggestion? For- um, well, my next recommendation was actually Nine Pints. Um, so it mm. is about blood, but it isn't squeamish or anything. So Rose George, British journalist, reminds us that blood is mysterious and it's feared, but it isn't something we should be afraid of. And I think her writing is really great for high school and adults. Um, she does talk about bloodletting and leeching a little bit, but, it, you know, it isn't gross or anything. But she mainly talks about how people, like the private plasma industry, right. and people are donating plasma and blood for money, which is really fascinating. And it's just a really great, great way to approach science and medicine and the combination of the two. I think that'd be a great start for high schoolers. Yeah, we had the author on. Yeah. Yes, yeah, she's great. She is, and her book on shipping, I think that was the previous book, just rock. Uh, Kat Warren, this... Uh, book is not this year's book, but she wrote a book called What the Dog Knows that uh, just came out in paperback last year and uh, is going to come out in a uh, young adult edition sometime this coming year. Uh, And it's a really great, you know, not a warm, huggy, fuzzy Mm -hmm. book, but a really smart, interesting book about how dogs think and how they interact with humans. And to briefly blow, I hate to do this, this is so embarrassing in a way, but Poisoner's Handbook, which was the book I did previously, uh, is becoming kind of a book of choice for high school chemistry teachers. And last year I went and talked to the National Association of High School Chemistry Teachers, and this year I'm talking to two different high school chemistry groups uh, about that book. And and I want to say that not just because, you know, poison and murder is accessible, but because because I love the idea of taking these kinds of books, Cat's mm-hmm. book or my book or, or Rose's book, and using them to remind people in the K-12 system how cool science is. Right. right. I think right. that's really important. Uh, I, I would throw in one I have a recommendation for. It's actually because you, you've expanded to other years. I had that recommendation for uh, the Dialogues, which came out last no, you know, November a year ago, but we didn't talk about it with Clifford Johnson until January. And it is a, you know, it's a graphic novel about science. Dialogues, the conversations about the nature of the universe. It's just absolutely amazing book. I need um, to read that one. You, I mean, it's just the issues that they get into, and it's just two people or a, a group of people in a graphic novel sitting and discussing stuff, you know, and, and in, com- in conversation that you might have in a cafeteria where he, he places some of his his characters. It's really well written. I read your description on the website, I read, yes. and I thought, I am go- so getting that book. It just <laughs> sounds Yes, you sense. sold me, too. Yeah. <laughs> Consensus. It yes. is, yeah. Uh, but, well, <laughs> do you have, Eric, what's the next yeah. on your list? Well, actually, it fits in well with um, the science honors uh, question. The Book of Why by Judea mm-hmm. Pearl. It's, it's an amazing book uh, that dissects the cause and effect story in science. Uh, and it really makes you think. It, it, it's a lot like uh, Danny Kahneman's um, Thinking Fast and Slow. It moves you to think uh, in system two mm. as far as how you should start. To, we, there's so much stuff that's written up that uh, associations and people jump to that this is the cause and effect story. And, of course, it's so difficult to prove. And this is about as thorough interrogation of the science of cause and effect as you could ever imagine. It's, it's a beautiful book. Oh, that's great because, you know, people don't know what science is. Yeah. They have a misconception of how science is done. Maybe this will help out. Um, this is Science Friday from WNYC Studios. I'm Ira Plato. We're talking about our best books of uh, 2018. Clock's ticking down. Let's see how many. Oh, it's Christmas tree on the board again. Let's go to Peg in West Central Florida. Hi, Peg. Hi. How are you? Fine. How are you? Go ahead. Okay, so I was fortunate enough to go to uh, Ocala this spring and hear James Briskione talk about his new book, The Flavor Matrix. And the subtitle of this book is The Art and Science of Pairing Common Ingredients to Create Extraordinary Dishes. So he paired with the supercomputer Watson to come up with all kinds of flavor pairs. I did get my cooking book. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. 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 So you, so you had how to how to make these great dishes with different flavors, and he used Watson Correct. to do it. Correct. Correct. And one of his favorites 
was chicken and mushroom burgers with strawberry ketchup, which I haven't tried yet, but I'm <laughs> going to. Uh, how could a computer be wrong? Right. <laughs> thanks, no. Peg. Greg, thanks for <laughs> saying that. I knew somebody would rescue, <laughs> yeah. me, rescue me. Um, yeah, that, that's, uh, you know, that's one of the one. We, we like to do the arts, and, you know, it's part of science here. It's theme instead of STEM. So I'm glad yep. someone threw that in. And any chance we get to use a cooking book or anything like that, we will. Uh, let me turn it back to you. Okay. What so, do you think, Stephanie? Oh, yeah, that sounds great. I'm not sure about the strawberry ketchup, <laughs> but I'll try, <laughs> I'll try the chicken and mustard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so my last pick was Dinosaur Artist um, by Paige Williams. And I know, Deborah, you liked it too. I did. Um, this was just really great narrative nonfiction. Her writing is just incredible. She dr- um, describes... Eric Procopi and his organization, Florida Fossils. He was an avid fossil collector, and he entered the for-profit fossil trade. So he was prepping fossils, selling them to auctions. And this story, like, we follow him like across the world. He's mm-hmm. going to like China, Japan, and eventually he ends up in Mongolia, where he um, obtains a fossil. And the whole climax reaches, whereas um, we don't really know. I think, as Deborah mentioned in her email, it's a morality issue. We don't really know the origin or the sources. So Mongolia tries to repatriate fossils, and it's kind of like a whole like, international law intrigue. Wow. It's almost like an adventure, like, wow. you know, mystery. It's just so fascinating. It touches on so many different subjects that are really relevant right now. And I thought it was just great writing and just so engrossing overall. Wow, that's great. Yeah. She's a gorgeous writer. She and is. It's one of those books that is science subversive, which I always like those, where the adventure and, and, and the sort of the mystery of the story right. pull you forward and woven through it as science. Let me give you a preview of Coming Attractions, which is also one of my favorite books. I'm reading it now because we're having the author on Ooh. in a few weeks. It's called American Eden by Victoria Johnson, and it talks about David Hussack, who was famous as being the doctor at the Burr-Hamilton, you know, shootout, and that's all that people knew about him, but he started the first um, Arboretum here in New York, which is buried now under Rockefeller Center, and it's an incredible history of him as a, first as a, as a doctor and then as a, a botanist. Oh, that's awesome. And I yeah. thought I knew about American history. It's one of my, you know, one of my hobbies, especially in the New York City area. I knew nothing about this guy. It's so. absolutely riveting reading about who this guy was. So adding that yeah. to my list too. So yeah. I'm Victoria. Yes. She'll be on in, in a few weeks. So I want to thank all of you for taking time to be with us today. St- uh, Stephanie Sandala is Associate Editor at Library Journal Reviews here in New York. Deborah Blum, Director of the Night Science Journalism Program at MIT and author of The Poison Squad. Thank you, Ira. Breaking records everywhere. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Dr. Eric Topol, a cardiologist, executive president and professor at Scripps Research in La Jolla. And, and uh, Eric, we're going to have you back to talk about your gadgets, okay? Sure. I saw your body scan that you did, and that was absolutely I need to listen to that one. With my smartphone. Yes, you did it with your smartphone, and you you picked up your kidney stones. We've got to talk about that, okay? So you'll have to come back. That'd be fun, sure. And we uh, we have a a full list of all our panelist recommendations and some of mine at uh, sciencefriday.com slash best books. Thank you all for taking time to be with us today. Happy holidays. Thank you, Ira. B.J. Liedemann composed our theme music, and a special thanks to our digital producer, Johanna Meyer, for helping us compile our best books list and uh, gathering all those voice messages and memos. Thank you, Johanna. Uh, We've run out of time on this uh, Pearl Harbor anniversary day, so I want to uh, wish everybody a great weekend.